Oh, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for everyone coming along tonight here to Murdoch University. Uh, it's a beautiful night to be out here in, in Rockingham. Um, I want to thank all those that are joining us on the live stream as well, and I hope you enjoy the lecture that we're going to have tonight. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging our country and acknowledging that the land on which we meet uh, belongs to the Wajok Noongar people, and I pay my respects uh, to their leaders, elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd like to recognise tonight the Chancellor of Murdoch University, Mr Gary Smith, who is also uh, Director of the WA Aboriginal Leadership Institute and also Co-Chair of Reconciliation Western Australia. Uh, it's, again, as I say, my great pleasure to welcome you to the second of our brand community lecture, lecture series, which we're holding in partnership with Murdoch University here on the Rockingham campus. Uh, this series uh, features experts in a range of fields discussing topics of interest to the community of brand uh, across this electorate. So I'm aiming by these uh, lectures to encourage education and discussion of such important topics. Uh, last month, uh, some of you may have been here, we, we launched uh, this uh, uh, series with a, um, a lecture on the health impacts of COVID-19 uh, from uh, Professor Jeremy Nicholson of the Phenome Centre based at Murdoch University. Uh, and tonight we're going to hear from another highly distinguished professor from Murdoch University, Professor Elaine Holmes, who is Director of the Centre for Computational and Systems Medicine and also a Premier's Research Fellow. Professor Holmes is a distinguished computational biologist who is involved in cutting edge oops, I'm gonna I've gone ahead one. I'll get to the emergency spots in a minute. I, um, I didn't check my slides first, sorry. Back to Professor Holmes. She's a distinguished computational biologist who is involved in cutting edge work on the interaction between microbes and humans. And earlier this year, she was awarded an Australian Laureate Fellowship by the Australian Research Council, which really is very much an honour for researchers around this country to receive. Uh, her work is making a major contribution to the understanding and treatment of many diseases, uh, particularly uh, those affecting ageing populations. Um, we've probably all read and heard a fair bit of research in uh, recent years about the importance to our health of uh, gut microbiome, compl the complex community of bacteria and other microbes that live in the intestine. Well, tonight we're going to get to hear from one of the experts in the field uh, from Elaine Holmes. Um, before I go on to finally uh, hand over, I'm going to do something I didn't do at the start, which is to tell you uh, and you got a preview before, about the emergency um, exit point. So should anything happen, um, stay calm, uh, listen, listen to uh, myself or Andrew or Kate uh, in the, in the um, room and we'll get you out to the evacuation point, which is just the car park outside, so not too far at all. So on to um, the lecture itself. So may I present to you Professor Holmes, uh, her lecture tonight of microbes, mice and men. Uh, please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the very kind introduction, and thank you for giving up your Thursday evening to come and listen to some of the science that we're doing uh, with Murdoch University. So the title, and I'll explain it as I go through the lecture, but of Microbes, Mice and Men, really is about why our gut microbiome, the bacteria in us, are important. So every single person here will have a kilogram to two kilograms of microbes or bacteria sitting in their guts and, and more throughout their body. So that really is a huge amount. And these microbes are very active. They take the things we eat and they turn them into other chemicals. And these chemicals act as signaling molecules in the body. And before I go any, any further, before I start the main body of the lecture, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're working on, the Wajak Nunja Nungabuja, and pay respects to all Ununga elders, past, present, and emerging. So, taking a step back, uh, what is a microbe? Well, a microbe is just another name for a microscopic organism, it comes from the Greek micro meaning small and bios meaning life. What we really understand about microbes, mostly when we talk about microbes in the human body, we're talking about bacteria. So this could be the gut bacteria, it could be the bacteria on our skin, 
or in any of the mucosal membranes we have. But also we've got other microorganisms that we're becoming very familiar with. So up at the top there is a coronavirus. We're all getting very used to the, to the viruses lately. Uh, right next to that, the, the, green, the, the green microorganisms, they are yeast. So yeast are also microorganisms. And we have also the protozoa. So if you think of protozoa, they could be uh, parasites and, and people are used to thinking of, of, of protozoa in those sorts of terms. So microorganisms don't have to be associated with disease, but we've come very much to consider them as, as causing disease or being part of disease. And it's really the relationship between health and disease I'd like to concentrate on today. So if we think of a human being as being... Uh, being a product of your genes, the genetics, and also the environment, what the genes give us is a blueprint of what we might become, what diseases we might get, what colour hair we might have, what, what colour eyes, and so forth. But when we're thinking about diseases, then it's not just the genes that are important, but also the environment, is how our genes interact with the environment. So the environment is everything we come into contact with, so it can be food and, and diet, it could be drugs, the, the drugs you get from the, the doctor, prescription drugs. It could be toxins and other contaminants we come into contact with in our environment. But also, as part of the environment, we have this kilogram, two kilograms of microbial, microbial organisms living inside us. And these, as I mentioned before, also produce chemicals and interact with our human bodies. Now, I'd like to say a little bit about what we do, and we're part of a diagnostic team. And what we do is we take urine and blood and any other body fluid or tissue that, uh, that, that we, we want to look at, and we look at it in terms of can we tell something about the biofluid, the body fluid, what's the urine telling us, can we tell if somebody's got diabetes, for example. And this is the new concept. Uh, people have been doing this way, way uh, since ancient times. And I really like this test tube of, of urines. This is a, a rainbow test tube of urines. And it's been taken in a pathology laboratory by somebody who just wanted to show that different, different, con different diseases, different diets will cause your urine to do different things or have different chemicals. So, for example, if you look at the, uh, the red color urines, I think you may have noticed some people, if they eat a lot of beetroot, your urine's going to turn pink. If you eat carrots, some people's urine will turn orange. If you take some drugs like indomethacin, for example, uh, and other, the other uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, some of them will make your urine turn blue or, or indigo. But also, if you have some disease conditions like kidney failure, then you're going to see deep purple or brown urine. So you've got this nice spectrum of urines, and the doctor will tell, be able to tell something about your health or your, what you've been doing uh, in terms of your diet in the past 24 hours. So, you know, we can look at a urine and we can say, ah, well, that gives us a clue as to what this person might have been doing or how they are. Now, we don't look at urine samples and look at the color anymore. That was just an example. What we have is some pretty fancy analytical uh, technology. And these are all basically either mass spectrometers or nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers, but really they're just fancy analytical machines for taking a biological sample and generating a chemical fingerprint for it. So this is some of our laboratories with the NMR spectrometers and the mass spectrometers. And in the black circle in the middle, I have printed out a urine spectrum. So you can see this spectrum's got a lot of signals in there, a lot of spikes. And each of these spikes or lines belongs to a different chemical. So I can look at this spectrum and say, ah, oh, well, this down here is, uh, this pic here is from carnitine. This means the person's been eating a lot of meat. Or over here, uh, there's some polyphenols. They might be linked, for example, to eating onions. So all your diet has a characteristic signature. But also, your body metabolism, your normal metabolism, your energy production, that also has an, a, its own signature. So you can see things that your body does normally, everyday processes, and we can monitor those. We can also look for chemicals that we've eaten. 
And then thirdly, what we can do is we know that the microbes take these chemicals from the diet and they transform them into other chemicals. So, for example, bacteria will take some of our diet, phenolics, and they'll turn them into chemicals that we can, we can detect and we can work out what's going on in terms of the bacterial metabolism. And different microbes, different types of bacteria will produce different chemicals and they'll all have a unique signature. And there are millions of bacteria in all of us, hundreds of thousands of different species at least, and they all do something a little bit different. And really, the research is working out how these bacteria interact with each other and what they're actually telling our bodies. So it's a little hard to see, but this, this circle here, this is pointing out the importance of the microbiome. So you get your microbiome from your mom when you're born. And if you're born naturally, by natural birth, then you'll pick up microbes as you come through the birth canal, the vaginal canal. And if you're born by cesarean, the first thing the doctor will do is usually put the baby on mum's chest, and those babies will pick up a little bit more of the skin bacteria. So babies get their initial bacteria or microorganisms from their immediate environment, and then as the baby grows and develops, the microbes, body of microbes, the community of microbes all develop with, uh, with the baby, so that by the time the baby reaches about two to three years old, they've got a relatively stable bacterial community in their guts. And this bacterial community helps them stay healthy throughout life. So there are two points in, in life when our bacterial communities are more plastic or more fluid than others. And the first is just between when you're born and when it stabilizes, about age two or three. So the microbiome, the microbiome as we call it, or the microbial community is very easy to influence at this point. So, uh, and I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a minute. But the other time point in somebody's life where the bacteria change quite a bit is when you hit what we term immunosenescence, but when you get to your late 50s to mid 60s, your immune system starts to change, starts to decline a little, and the bacteria in your gut tend to de de-diversify, so it becomes more simple. You lose some of the different species of bacteria, and this, at this point, it's quite easy to change the bacterial community too. If you have healthy bacteria, you're generally quite, uh, this goes along with being generally quite healthy, but if your bacteria, your gut bacteria, get to be out of balance, then this can cause diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, but it's also linked to other diseases that perhaps you wouldn't imagine so easily. So the bacteria don't just affect where they're sitting in your gut. They make chemicals that signal to all over the body. So, for example, uh, if you look in the urine, we excrete things like hepurate and phenylacetylglutamine. These are just two chemicals, and they, they have signaling function in the kidney. There are other chemicals that signal in the muscles, uh, uh, things like vitamin K, vitamin B7, these are chemicals, these are vitamins that are made by your gut bacteria. And my favorite are the chemicals that are made by the gut bacteria and then signal very rapidly to the brain. So you have neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA, and these are all chemicals that are telling your brain to do something. So you'll have heard of the gut-brain connection. We have in the, in, in the English language, we have uh, an expression, I've got a gut feeling. Well, that expression's come from somewhere, and we've known for a long time that the gut and the brain are connected. If you're slightly nervous about something or you're anxious, you know that you start to get twinges in your intestines. Sometimes you need to go to the loo more. It, it's kind of, they, they are very viscerally connected. So if we just think about the things that affect uh, babies when they're born, I've just mentioned the, the mode that you're, bur you're born by, whether it's natural or cesarean, that can affect your early microbiome. But also whether you feed your baby breast milk or bottle, that will also influence the microbiome development. And even the weaning strategy. So in some countries uh, like Italy, they really promote carbohydrates as the first food. In other communities and countries, they promote car proteins as baby's first food. And whichever pattern of uh, foods you introduce also shape the, 
shape the microbiome and the bacterial communities. We are told that it's good to be clean, and it is good to be clean, but uh, people may have hear, hear heard of the hygiene hypothesis. If you're too clean, then the babies aren't exposed to micro, enough microbes. You don't build up your immunity. So that also affects the way your, your microbiome develops. And even things like what you give your child, um, if you give them, you know, for, for a temperature, if you give them cowpole or some baby medicine, some of these medicines interact with the gut microbiome too and can change the development of the microbes. So we did a study about 10 years ago with a group of people at Imperial College and one of the things we know about the microbiome and about babies is that when they're born preterm, too small, or too small, too low birth weight, that they are susceptible to developing insulin resistance and diabetes downstream. And the title of my lecture is of, my, uh, of microbes, mice, and men. Well, the reason for men is that men seem to be much more susceptible than women to this early microbial community uh, formation. So, for example, if you, take, if you take young adults at age 18 to 25 who were born preterm, we know they're born preterm, they don't have any obvious diseases, but if you compare these adults, young adults, with age-matched group who were just born at normal time or and not low birth weight, what you notice is that if you generate this fingerprint, this chemical fingerprint, all the chemicals I've colored in red are those chemicals that are different in the young adults who were born preterm. So even 20 years after the event of being born, the body has this memory of how they were born. And we know that these, we know that there's a, a link uh, between, between the diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and preterm birth premature birth, but it's much, much more obvious in men than it is in women. And when we looked at the urine profiles, I've listed the chemicals here. Uh, it doesn't really much matter what the chemicals are, but the ones that are shaded, for example, the bile acids, uh, the methylamines, dimethylamine, trimethylamine, these are all chemicals that the human body makes part of, but needs gut bacteria to make the final transformation. So this is a real bacterial human collaboration in making chemicals. And it turns out that a large proportion of the chemicals that are different between someone who is born preterm and somebody who is born at the normal, you know, full-term birth, um, the, the microbes, the microbial chemicals are really very different. So how does this the impact, it might have a relationship with, with liver uh, and uh, metabolic syndrome. We know, for example, that the people who were born preterm did, the men did have increased fatty liver, even though they had no disease. But it also impacts a bit earlier on in life. So autism's been quite a hot topic for many years, and there's all sorts of theories out there as to what causes autism. And it seems that it's a mosaic disease, which means that there are multiple factors responsible for causing the autism. Now, some autism is undoubtedly genetic, and others involves environmental, strong environmental influences. There was a, uh, a, a, a um, group in Reading in the UK who looked at autistic children, and they took the feces from children who were autistic and their siblings, and they did some bacterial profiling. They looked to see what sort of bacteria were in the feces. And the feces of autistic children had many, many more species of a bacteria uh, named Clostridia. And this is the same bacteria, for example, Clostridium difficile that causes hospital-acquired infections. Other strains of this, other species in this group were related to autism. Now, we looked at some urines collected from children between age three and eight who had autism. We looked at their, their brothers and sisters, and we looked at age-matched age control group of children. And what you can see from the graphs down at the bottom, you can see that the autistic children are very different in terms of the urine fingerprint from the normal children or the healthy children 
but also that they're very different from their brothers and sisters too. And if we look at the, uh, look at the fingerprint on this side, we can see that there are many, many more signals in this area, uh, in the blue and the green, the blue being the autistic and the, and the, the autistic children, and the, the green being the autistic children, and the blue being their brothers and sisters. And you can see that they have a lot more signals than the controls do. And these signals are coming from various chemicals. One of them is called paracresol sulfate. Now, cresols aren't something humans make. Creosote is what you pay into your garden fence with. It's, it's, a, it's what we think of as a nasty chemical. And the only way we can find it in our urine or in the body is if it's made by the bacteria. So we know absolutely that this is a bacterially made chemical, and we know that it's, uh, it is made by some of the Clostridia species. So again, we can see the activity of these bacteria producing these chemicals, which we think of as being toxic normally. So just switching microbiomes uh, to give you another example of how, how the microbiome, how bacteria control health. If we think of the vaginal microbiome now, we know that if you've got a healthy balance of the vagi vaginal flora or bacteria, there's that you, uh, this is associated with having healthy babies. If you have a disrupted microbial community in the vaginal canal before birth, then this condition can lead to preterm labor and potential neonatal follow-ups. Then the babies are more likely to develop toxic conditions after birth, and it's generally associated with poor, poor outcomes, clinical outcomes. So we had access to some, some women who uh, had given birth prematurely, so premature rupture of the membranes, and we, ha we compared these with women who went to full-term birth. And if you look at the, the graph at the top, the top right-hand side here, you can see there are two groups of the premature rupture women. One of them has almost exclusively lactobacilli in the vaginal fluid, and the others have a big mixture of things, again, like Clostridia, but also Fusobacteria, Actinobacteria, lots of different bacterial species. So for 50% of the women who went on to have premature rupture of the membranes, they had an abnormal or dysfunctional vaginal microbiome. And again, if you take the vaginal fluid and put it into an NMR spectrometer and collect the, collect the spectra, it's separated very nicely, and you can see a lot of chemicals that the bacteria are producing, things like lactate and other organic acids that we can pick up and say, this is abnormal. So we can think of beginning to make a diagnostic test made just from a simple vaginal scrape, saying this person has a set of chemicals that we would tend to associate with a bad, uh, bad pregnancy outcome. So if you've been looking at the, the news, you've probably all come across the big promise of microbial manipulation. We know the bacteria are related to health, but what can we do about it? And there's all sorts of crazy ideas out there. So, there's one restore product. It's a liquid circuit board boosting your microbiome diversity. Well, you'd have to drink about 10 gallons of it a day to actually have a real effect. There's another one here, especially for infants. You have other ones for, uh, for pregnant women. You have other ones for athletes. So there's a real market there. And my favorite is the colon blow, colon cleansing kit. So a lot of people advocate, clear your bacteria out, start again with a better product. Does it work? Not really. Um, because, and I'll come back to why it doesn't work. But there's a whole whole financial market out there being propped up by the promise of microbial manipulation. And now I'd like to show you the ultimate probiotic, which is your fecal microbial transplant. Now, these do work in certain circumstances, and I'll come back to that. But at the minute, they're not regulated in many countries. And fecal microbial transpla transplant really just means you, do, you use your colon blow, you clean your colon out, and then you put somebody else's gut bacteria or feces inside yourself, either upwards or downwards, depending on, on the, the doctors. And it's got to be so popular, particularly in America, that they have it on the internet, a DIY, do-it-yourself. There's a shopping list. And um, 
My favourite item on here is the big brown bath towel. It's, um, <laughs> so, uh, it's absolutely, absolutely full of hype and, and can be quite dangerous. Now, there's no doubt that fecal microbial transplant is one of the only treatments that work for people who have Clostridium difficile infection and haven't been able to clear it by drugs and they become drug resistant. But it's not a new idea, and this is, a, this is something I found in a paper by de Groot and al. Uh, they, did, they published this back in 2017, and they showed that in the literature, the fecal microbial plant transplant idea dates back to at least the fourth century uh, Chinese, Ch in Chinese medicine. And there they, uh, the, the physicians were writing a piece, a paper about a child, the benefits of, of actually ingesting feces from a child who'd only consumed lupins, bread, and wine. So they knew that the children in general had a healthier microbiome. Hopefully we've evolved quite away from that. Um, but there's good and bad here. So you have success stories like this lady here who, whose toddler almost died of Clostridium difficile infection, and the last resort was to give the child a, a microbial transplant, and it completely cured the two-year-old. However, you had another story uh, which the FDA picked up on, where the fecal microbial transplant transplanted some genes for, micro, for drug resistance into two of the recipients of the treatment, and they both died. So, Again, it, it, there's good and bad, but there's not a lot of regulation out there. And if it's done by a hospital in a controlled condition, then it generally works, but not always. So there's a lot we don't understand about how our bacteria really interact. And just to show you more American crazy, uh, apologies to any Americans out there, <laughs> but uh, there's a company, um, a company called uh, Populate or Repopulate, and... Um, you can make $13,000 a year by selling your, your poo, basically, to this company. $40 a sample with a $50 bonus if you come in five days a week. Now, so just, just a thought. Okay, so stepping away from that a little bit, but I'll come back to the whole microbes and, and fecal microbial transplants. We want to think about what uh, bacteria do for our health, and in one area we know they're connected is obesity and diseases that are linked to obesity like diabetes and like uh, cardiovascular disease. And if we take a world map and we color it according to the countries that have a problem with clinical obesity, we have a lot of the Gulf states, uh, America, also Venezuela and some of Polynesia. Most of these countries have over 30% of the population who have a BMI of 30 or greater, which is clinically obese. We know that this isn't uh, split across populations equally. So, for example, um, non-Hispanic blacks have a much higher uh, propensity for obesity in, in the States than non-Hispanic whites. Uh, and Asians have the lowest, the lowest levels of obesity. So we also have to think about ethnic differences when we're looking at this. Somebody calculated the cost of obesity in the US, which to be 190 billion back, way back in 2013, and then they also estimated it cost $1 billion to fly overweight passengers around America. So countries see it very much as a financial problem, just as much as, as a, a health problem. And we know that obesity is a problem, just as it is in the UK. It's a problem, a big problem in WA. It's predicted to cost six, $610 million uh, by 2026. And again, we know that the demographic isn't equal across. It's, it's worse in the regions that, than it is in, uh, in central Perth. So what can we actually do about it? Well, first of all, we need to know what, the, this, uh, what is causing the obesity, and some of it's obvious. You need to exercise, you need the right diet. Your genes help you if you're lucky enough to have good genes. We know that inflammation is, is involved with obesity. Uh, so obesity causes inflammation, which then causes less activity in general. So it's all a vicious circle. And the gut microbiome is linked to uh, inflammation, and we know that the gut microbiome 
is also influenced by our genes and also has an impact on obesity. Now, Donald Trump likes to tell us how healthy he is. He's been in the news a lot lately. Um, and he, he sort of told his doctor to certify him as healthy. But if you look at the BMI, he is obese and he does have high cholesterol. So even Donald Trump isn't immune from this obesity epidemic. Now, here's an American that is sort of the opposite of, of Donald Trump. He's one of my, my all-time heroes. It's Professor Jeremiah Stamler from Northwestern University in Chicago, and he turned 101 last month. He's still writing scientific publications, and he's still doing his research, and he's very driven. He's the first person to collect salt intake in the diet with high blood pressure, but he's also interested in obesity, and one of his big questions was how does our diet influence obesity, and why do we have a worse diet health relationship in the East than they do in Asia, countries like China and Japan. So here is a, a spectrum, this finger, this chemical fingerprint is a urine spectrum and I've color coded all the chemicals that are either higher in red or lower in blue in a group of obese people versus, this is a, a 1800 people with obesity versus about the same number of people who are normal or healthy weight. And you can see that there's quite a few chemicals here. Looking at a Saudi Arabian population for comparison, uh, you don't much have to know what the, the chemical fingerprints are, but you see lots of red signals. Lots of things are altered or different between people who are overweight and obese and people who are normal weight. And I've just listed some of the top chemicals here. And a lot of them, colored in blue, are things like amino acids that are to do with energy metabolism. Um, you have, but you also have chemicals like your cresol sulfates, again, they're gut microbial, hippurate, gut microbial. So about a third or greater, maybe even a half of the chemicals that have a signature of obesity or, or correlated with obesity are those coming from your gut, micro, your gut microbiome, your bacteria, or some sort of communication between you and your bacteria. And I'm tremendously comforted by this because I like to think that being overweight for me is because I've got bad bacteria, not because, it's, not because I don't diet properly. Um, so if you compare the Americans with the Saudi population, they're a little bit different, but the things that are most different between the two populations in terms of obesity are the gut microbial parts of the signature. So which isn't surprising if you think about the types of diets we have wouldn't be the same in America as it would in, in the Middle East. So it's to do with the diet being different, but it's the same gut microbia that are responsible for both. So of mice, men, and microbes, uh, where the mice come into it, it turns out that if you have mice and you give them antibiotics, and then you do a transplant with somebody who has uh, thin, somebody from somebody who's very thin, if you have an obese mouse, they'll get thin. If you have uh, a thin mouse and you give them a transplant from a human who is overweight, they'll become overweight. So bacteria from lean humans can slim obese mice. And there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of people who have researched, uh, mainly groups in America like Jeffrey Gordon's, on this. It turns out you can do the same in humans. You can take a donor, uh, for example, some of the people who've had Clostridium difficile who've had received bacteria from donors who are a little bit overweight. They've never been overweight before in their life, and people are finding that you suddenly start to become overweight after receiving the, the transplant. It's not just as simple as that, but the bacteria definitely control weight. It's been proven in, in mice, it's been proven in men. So, one of the things we do in, uh, when we can't treat obesity by diet alone is that we can opt for surgery. So, some of the, sur the surgery for weight loss is usually called bariatric surgery, and one of the most popular sorts is just removing most of the stomach and then joining what's left of the stomach to lower down in the <coughs> intestine. And it doesn't come without problems. People who have this surgery 
need to be on lifelong vitamin supplements, and there, there are various drawbacks. However, it is known to work very well for weight loss. When you do this, it turns out that you see a massive shift in people's gut bacteria. So we have bacteria called firmicutes, and these all change. And instead of having lots of firmicutes, you get lots of proteobacteria. And these are the proteobacteria are generally not thought of as being healthy bacteria. Also, you see, after the surgery, you get an increase of all your energy metabolites. Mitochondrial metabolites tend to increase even though the diet is the same or reduced calorie, you get more energy metabolism. And you also get more generation of these paracresols and other microbial compounds. Now, in the short term, this is very good for, for, uh, for health. We know that obesity is not just associated with cardiovascular health, but it's also associated with things like uh, migraines. You have asthma is more prevalent if you have obesity you get sleep apnea. So bariatric surgery does tend to, to cure a lot of this. And the most surprising thing of all is that if somebody has type 2 diabetes, after bariatric surgery, the type 2 diabetes resolves almost immediately, whereas it takes a week or two to achieve weight loss. So it's not just the weight loss that is causing the metabolic shift. And so if you look at people before and after bariatric surgery, you can see before in blue, and then after in red, this is the urine, and this is the, the stool samples. They change chemically. And the chemical changes, lots of different ones, but I just want to point out one of them in the feces is after bariatric surgery, you get a huge increase in GABA, and this is a highly neuroactive compound. And some of the, pe some of the uh, people who'd undergone bariatric surgery will say that they've got improved cognition, there's a better, uh, better clarity of thought after having the surgery. But there was another group of women, and particularly the husbands were complaining that their wives seemed a bit woolly, and that it wasn't, so, so again, not very clear. There's a change in the microbial structure. Some people seem to get much, cl much clearer cognition and ability to think and other people it perhaps goes a little bit the other way. But again, it does underline that there's this connection between the brain and the gut. And there was some work done uh, with the bariatric surgery. We looked at the uh, microRNA. So this is the epigenetic factors, things that work alongside the genes to, uh, to modify the effects of genes. And I won't go into the details except to say that this is a list of all the different pathways that are affected by bariatric surgery. And everything that's colored purple is a pathway related to a neurodegenerative disease or neurological effects. So after bariatric surgery, a pathway that's normally associated with Parkinson's disease is suddenly switched on. And you get the same for things like uh, same for things like Huntington's disease, which is also a neurodegenerative condition. So again, emphasizing the gut-brain connection. And John Cryan from Cork in, the, in, in Ireland, he's done a lot of work around the gut microbiome and brain. And he's done a lot of work showing that the microbiome, microorganisms, the bacteria, uh, some of the fungi as well, ha make mind-altering chemicals, and he studied a lot on the, the behavior and shown the relationship between mood and your microbes. And this is where things like prebiotics and probiotics, so probiotics being live organisms that you take in, like yog in, in, say, for example, in yogurts, and prebiotics is something you would take to help those organisms grow, so some sort of carbohydrate that they would feed on that would encourage the growth of a good organism. So by by changing people's microbiome slightly, by giving them some pre and probiotics over a fairly lengthy period of time, did have a real impact on the mood of these people. Now, we wanted to know, we know that bariatric surgery has an effect on the micro microbes. And one of the questions we asked was, OK, so how long does the effect last? And one of, the, one of the side effects, if you like, of having bariatric surgery is that you find that women often get pregnant soon afterwards. They feel better, they look better, they're, they're, they're much happier in general because they've lost the weight. And we had a lot of people getting pregnant within the first two years. 
And when we profiled these women throughout their pregnancy, what we found is that their urine composition was very different to start with. It stayed different. And when they gave birth to the babies, what we found is that the ones who had uh, what we call the malabsorptive gastric ba uh, bariatric surgery, which is the sort I talked about before, where you, where you reroute the intestine, what you found was that these women passed their biological function onto the babies. So the babies had higher levels of cresols, higher levels of phenols in their urine, and they had a much more diverse microbiome. And when we looked at the, the, uh, the clinical statistics for the babies, then the babies tended to be slightly smaller in, in birth weight, which perhaps isn't so good. But uh, the, they also, as further downstream, they have better insulin control-related statistics. So it seems that bariatric surgery may be good uh, in terms of the next generation. But again, not enough research out there to be able to say conclusively that it has no, no effect. So what can we do about our microbes? And this is, uh, this is where precision nutrition comes into it. And with COVID, as has been reading a lot in the literature, people did one of two things, it seems. We all went out and exercised, or half of us did, and the other half, like me, sat indoors and ate more. Um, so how can, we, how can we move that? Well, if you think about dieting, it's generally, it generally isn't very effective on a population scale. We tend to have this really good resolution, New Year's resolution or whatever time of year it is, we have a resolution, we want to diet, we lose the weight. If you go on to a diet that's quite strict, then you maybe uh, you start having cravings, you want more food, you start eating again, you gain weight, and you get this yo-yo effect. So just a game here. Anybody, can, can anybody guess who's a fan of the paleo diet? No. No, it's actually Jessica Beale. So, so she's, the paleo diet is the hunter-gatherer, raw and whole food diet. No grains, legumes, or dairy. Um, humans today, okay, so it's a promoting raw foods. Humans today don't have exactly the same gut bacteria. They can't always cope with a lot of raw food like we used to be able to many hundreds of years ago. So paleo diet does work for somebody, but it can come with health effects. Atkins diet. Yeah, <laughs> so Kim Kardashian's an absolute fan of the Atkins diet, and this is the high-fat, high-protein, low-carb diet. Um, again, can cause rapid, you know, can have the effect of having rapid weight loss, but it can also cause increases in cholesterol because you're eating a lot of fat, and most people don't tend to be able to sustain that. Mediterranean diet. Penelope. Yep, Penelope Cruz. So, the Mediterranean diet, what we would think of as a sensible diet, is increasing good fats, decreasing bad fats, lots of, uh, lots of fish, lots of green vegetables, lots of citrus. And this is associated with a long-term sustained decrease in cardio, uh, cardiovascular disease risk. 5-2 diet. Benedict. Yep, Benedict Cumberbatch. So this is how he loses weight on when he, he has to slim down for a, for a film. Um, so... Again, many people think that this is, is doable. It's where you eat normally for five days, and then for two days you would, a week you would fast to something below or equal to 400 calories, which is really quite low. It's not suitable for people prone to blood pressure drops, and some people just can't tolerate this diet, which leaves Madonna, and there's no need to comment really. Uh, this is the werewolf diet. So this is a diet... Uh, where there's periodic fasting according to phases of the moon. So when you have a new moon, you, eat, you drink only liquid. As it gets bigger, you go into baby food and then end up on solid food. It, it's a complete lunacy. <laughs> so what can we really do? Which, you know, how can we actually have a healthy diet? So there's a study that Isabel Garcia Perez did at Imperial College, and what she did was to take the world health organization guidelines for healthy eating and she put people on a hundred percent healthy diet which for some reason a bizarre reason she's colored red red is good here not bad and then there were different gradations of diet going down to 25 percent healthy which would 
equivalent, it's equivalent perhaps of having um, five days a week eating fast foods like McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken, so it's, it's not a good diet. So she put people into a metabolism suite, which is where they can't get out. They live in a metabolism suite for four days. They're given the diet, and they are given, everybody's given the same diet. They're watched all the time. All the biofluids, the blood and the urine are collected, and they can't cheat. There's no opportunity for cheating. And after the four days, they go home for a month or so, and then they come back and they go on to the next diet. And they, they do the diets in random order. They might do very good going through to very bad, or, or they might start with very bad and then very good. So they do them all in a random order. But when you collect the urine samples and run them, do the metabolic fingerprinting, you can see that the red and the blue here are very distinct. So metabolically, these, the, the diet is having quite a big impact. But what's more interesting is that it doesn't have the same effect on everybody. So people can eat exactly the same diet, but they don't have exactly the same effect. If you eat a healthy diet, of course, you're generally going to become healthier. You're going to lose weight. Your blood pressure will get better. But some people have a better response to diet than others. And I like to show these two people. One of them is actually my best friend, Donna, from home, and, and that's her mom. So her mom's in her, her 70s. And she was actually the star of our diet program because we took, we took 50 people and we monitored them over, over a six-month period just doing their normal daily diet and trying to remain healthy. And it turns out that if 100% is where healthy should be, and we know this from the diet models we did when people were in the controlled environment, you can see that Donna, who is generally healthy but likes, she does quite a bit of exercise, but she... She likes chocolate. She likes a glass of wine now and then. Um, you can see what happens when she has a bad diet day. She dips right down from 100% to only 25% healthy. And she's slightly lactose intolerant. You can see the effect of milk here. And her metabolism is quite, quite flexible. Whereas her mum, who's been healthy all her life, she's, she's mostly vegetarian. She does lots of exercise. She doesn't drink. Um, she's not much fun to be with, but, um, <laughs> but she's 100% healthy. And she can have the cakes and she can have the bad diet at the same time as Donna because they live in the same house. But she doesn't, come off that, she doesn't come off that healthy profile, so her metabolism is quite strong. And here, if you look at these spider webs, uh, what these are are metabolic connections between a few hundred chemicals in the body. And this is looking at the difference between the healthy and the unhealthy diet. And you can see for some people, this blue spider web here, this blue set of connections, is where the diet doesn't really have much effect. It doesn't matter if you're eating a really good diet or a really bad diet. There are pathways that are switched on in a slightly greeny orange color, but not much is happening. Whereas the person above, when you compare the healthy to unhealthy diet, you can see all the metabolic pathways suddenly light up. And if you look at the urine, the calories they're excreting in urine, so that you look at how many calories you're wasting in your urine, you can see that the people who have the good response, or the big response to diet, they excrete more calories in the urine than other people. So when we ask why, what is the difference between a good diet responder and a bad diet responder, it's lots of different chemicals, but some of the main ones come back down to being microbial, your bacterial metabolites again. So phenylacetyl, glutamine, paracrisol, sulfate, indoles. These are all different between the people who respond very easily and not so easily to diets. So you can start to think, you can start to think about a system whereby we can have personalized nutrition. We can see which foods people respond well to and which foods they don't and we're trialing this now with our dietitians we have uh, some dietitians who work with us and they use the feedback of the urine results in their diet clinics to see how did the mediterranean diet work for this person would they be better if it was slightly more like an atkins diet or, more, or a healthy version of the atkins diet or what if you put more fruit into somebody's diet what does it actually do and they work with people week on week to try and optimize the diet to have the best regulation they can of the metabolic pathways. So that's kind of personalized or precision, precision nutrition, but you can also extend that into the disease, uh, disease, health and disease concepts as well. 
And thank you for listening. I'd just like to thank, finish by acknowledging the people who did notice the work. I haven't actually got everybody on from Murdoch University. Uh, there's a huge team now there who've contributed, uh, but Tobin on the bioinformatics, Jeremy Mickelson and Ray Lang, who've helped do a lot of the, the work, and then from Imperial College, the people who dro drove the diet studies there, really Isabel Garcia Perez, Gary Frost, and Joram Posner. Thank you for listening, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Elaine. We will have a few questions. Um, we've all learned a lot out of that, <laughs> um, more than we could ever imagine, perhaps. Um, I suppose the, but one of the, there's a number of takeaways. One of the ones for me is say no to um, uh, faecal microbial transplants at home. So <laughs> go, to the, go to the hospital, see a professional. So are there any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, one up the back there, there's a microphone there. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Early in the lecture, you mentioned that autism was a disease. What, what factors make it a disease? Not a disease. It's a, it's a condition. It's a neurodevelopmental condition. Okay, good. Um, what sort of factors does a woman's age come into the health of a child um, and the way their microbes form? Like, for example, a woman giving birth at 20 as opposed to a woman giving birth at 45. So there's not a huge amount in the literature about that, but... The studies that have, uh, from, from the studies that have been published, uh, as I mentioned, as you go through life, your bacteria tend to uh, lose some diversity. Um, so you would expect you would you would expect that to reflect in the bacteria that the the, uh, the infants pick up. However, from the studies out there, there haven't been big enough studies. There's only been very small. And you can't really say conclusively that the age makes a specific difference to a specific type of bacteria. I'm sure, I'm sure there is a relationship, but nobody, as far as I know, has come up with that yet. Okay. I uh, apologize. I've just got two short more questions. Um, <laughs> what effects does uh, microbes have in the body um, when someone has hemochromatosis? I'm not entirely sure of the specific effects, but again, the chemicals that signal between the microbes and the, the other organs in the body, including the blood, uh, including liver, there is a chemical relationship. So if you have hemochromatosis, you will have an altered microbiome. Again, if you look at the literature, there are various studies, and they tend to have come out with a different set of microbes. Now, this is partly because when you take a set of microbes, if I have say 20 microbes in me, they may do something different than the same microbes in somebody else, in, in you, for example, because it depends, it's a community thing, so it depends on who else is there and what they're doing. So everybody has a job to do, a chemical to make, and they all interrelate in a specific way. They take on roles, and the roles might be different. So when you get studies across countries or even within a country across different, across different research centers, you will find that the actual microbes you come up with might be different from study to study. What does tend to remain the same, though, is the, the, the metabolic signature from the microbes. And for hemochromatosis, there doesn't appear to be much done on that at the minute. Okay. Thank you so much for everyone's patience. Our last question. Um, I don't mean to hurt anyone here. Um, I'm borderline underweight, and I've tried to put on weight as best I can, both fat and muscle. I did an experiment where I did um, two weeks uh, of my regular normal diet routines, monitored myself. Then I did two weeks of going on a diet, monitored again. Two weeks again, I tried an unhealthy diet, and then I, I fasted for uh, not the full two weeks, but like once every three days I would eat then. And there was little to no change in my energy levels or my breathing or even my weight, no matter how much I'm monitored. So why has that happened to me, for example? That could be any number of reasons. So genetically, you could be more efficient at burning energy. You could have a very different microbiome that's very efficient, or not very efficient, rather, at harvesting calories, just checks everything out as soon as it gets it. Um, it could be the amount of energy you use during a day. 
if you put a monitor on people when they're asleep, people who tend to be, have less weight, they'll move a lot more in their sleep, for example, so it could be the amount you move, the muscles you use, or it could be a combination of all those and more. It's, um, th there, isn't, there isn't a one-off answer to, to that, but you can definitely try and work out what it is by monitoring your metabolism. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, it's a really complex system we all live with it, isn't it? That uh, you can have to do those analyses and can't quite find the answers. Um, another couple of questions. Uh, can I up the back here and we'll come down to you if that's okay? Just so we can move the microphone around. Thank you. So other than the um, faecal transplant, is there nothing else that will really affect or help you to improve maybe your gut like I was going to go on a fermenting course, so <laughs> is it like, don't bother going on the fermenting course <laughs> no. and eating sauerkraut and, and all the kind of stuff that you get in the supermarket? No, I was being, I was being a little bit flippant. The, the, for the, that's because there's a lot of hype in the literature, but if you take probiotics every day and you take them along with prebiotics in Nilan or some other, some other uh, probiotic food that the bacteria will will use over time, you can at least temporarily, while you're taking the probiotics, change your metabolism, but you've got to, you've got to remember how much, uh, the, the effect is not going to be huge because this has to be constantly producing the chemicals to interact. So there are, there are definite benefits, there are definitely studies that have shown benefits, benefits in mood, benefits in weight loss, um, benefits in anxiety, benefits with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, bowel disease with pre and probiotic different combinations of pre and probiotics and there's a lot of uh, a lot of researchers have done some work in animal experiments showing exactly exactly that too so yes they can work um, it isn't a, a it isn't this massive effect and it doesn't just because you buy a product off a shelf that says it has live lactobacillus in it doesn't mean that it does by the time you by the time you take it. So there's products and there's products. So if you go to a, if you go to a proper health shop or, you know, for example, Procter & Gamble makes some pretty good, um, pretty good probiotics and they've done a lot of research. But it isn't, it isn't the cure-all. I think it can help. The, the, the probiotics, probiotics can definitely help, but it's not a, an instant cure-all. Unless you have a completely disordered gut microbiome in, in the first place. So, um, like I said, in infants or in people who've had Clostridium difficile where, where the, the, um, the resident microbes are cleared out, then you can influence recolonization. That is an easier thing to do. Thanks very much. Down the front here is there? Um, I just wanted to know if. Um, with a cesarean birth, is there less chance of the, the baby having the more microbiome? And does that give them a higher risk of autism? So with cesarean birth, it's generally thought, because you get more skin-related bacteria like Staphylococcus um, and less Lactobacillus, for example, and it's been linked to, there's been some pretty good research on metabolic syndrome and diabetes in later life. There have been quite a few studies on autism. I'm certainly not convinced about the, the, any association whatsoever about cesarean birth and, and, and autism. That's way too big a leap to make. Um, and it has to, again, it's very difficult because you're starting off with cesarean versus natural birth, but then you've also got, you know, breast versus bottle and what foods you introduce. So there are a lot of factors in early life, but there have been some pretty, pretty convincing studies that um, natural birth is better for things, for chronic diseases later on in life. But I think the childhood has also been linked to a reduction in asthma and eczema. But these, these are big studies and you're getting a percentage correlation. So yes, for example, if you have cesarean, birth, you're more likely to have children who will have asthma, but it's, it's a small percentage more. It's, it's not huge. So two more questions. Just the lady next door and then up to you in the third row. See you first, please, ma'am. What about autoimmune hepatitis? Does that affect the gut? Because yes. that's something that is you don't control yourself whatsoever 
other than then taking medication. So the gut bacteria are very strongly linked to your immune function. Um, and it's a bit chicken and egg. They can, the bacteria can cause inflammation and then immune conditions, but they will also change when you have an immune condition. So yes, if you have autoimmune hepatitis, you will see a change in the gut bacteria. For example, you get more phenylacetylglutamine. Um, but that's associated with good conditions and it's good, it's con that is associated with a good outcome in some conditions and a poor outcome in others. So again, it, it's immensely complicated, but you will definitely have, the, 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 if you have uh, autoimmune hepatitis, you will definitely have a disordered microbiome. And does the medication affect the gut for, that we have to take for it? Yes, medication can, uh, I, I don't know about all medication, but there are medications that affect the gut bacteria. There's a lot of, for example, I get, uh, the, the best example is antibiotics, you'll kill all your gut bacteria, but um, paracetamol would be one. If you take paracetamol, then you mop up the sulfur pools, so some of the bacteria need to sulfate, metabolize, so you'll change, you'll change what they're able to do. So there's a big link with, with medication and gut bacteria. Um, one last question, just the lady in the third row. Just pop your hand up, ma'am. There we go. Thanks. Hi, that's been very interesting. Thank you very much. I um, would like to know what's the best uh, test that you can uh, speak to your GP about to find out the state of your, your gut, um, having gone through um, a year of various uh, intrusive and non-intrusive tests, um, I'm getting conflicting uh, information. I want to know where the best information is on and where I can access what you've been talking about as well. So there are lots of tests for gut health. GPs won't generally look at the microbiome, other than they may recommend if you've had a course of antibiotics, for example, a lot of GPs will recommend you have to take probiotics to try and restore the more beneficial bacteria. But the things I was showing you are all very much more in the research stage, so they haven't hit mainstream medicine yet. And the main reason for that is because we don't fully understand the consequences. You may get an improvement, but what are the long-term consequences? Like the bariatric surgery, you know, you know cures diabetes, get change in the microbiome, you can, you, can, uh, you can influence that, but what does that mean long term? It might be good for heart disease, but maybe some of the chemicals you change might be drive you towards cancer or something, for example. So I think the reason you can't just turn up at your GPs and say, what can you do to, to make my, my gut healthier? A is everybody's individual and it's, it's kind of trial and error. And th there are things out there you can do, but there's no one simple prescription for if you do this, you improve this type of bacteria. Um, and, and there's not enough long-term evidence of, of you know, good effect now. Is it still a good effect in 10 years' time? Thanks very much uh, to everyone for the questions and to Elaine. I'm going to um, hand over now to uh, Chancellor Gary Smith for the vote of thanks. Thank you. Evening, everybody. Um, Elaine's just delivered all that straight off the top of the head, and I'm doing a vote of thanks, and I need some notes. So, um, but I will, um, at the outset, um, thank the member for Brand, the Honourable Madeline King for working with Murdoch University to uh, deliver the Brand Community Lecture Series for the people of Rockingham. It's, uh, it's great. And right at the outset, um, both in my Reconciliation WA role and my Chancellor role, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land that we're on. Even though this is at the end of the night, I still love to do that, the, uh, to uh, recognise the Wadjuk and the Binjara people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land that Murdoch University campuses uh, reside on and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the emerging leaders across the community. This is a great initiative. It's the first talk I've, I've been to and uh, to have uh, local residents hearing about cutting edge research from uh, people like uh, Professor Holmes uh, is, is a great opportunity and uh, she's the, uh, as, as Madeline said, the director at our Phenome Centre, the University Centre for Com Computational Systems Medicine. She's also a Premier's Research Fellow 
and an Australian Research Council very recently named as a Laureate Fellow as of July this year. So uh, she's, uh, she's really a, um, a huge catch for, uh, for uh, Murdoch University. She hates me saying that sort of thing, but we're so proud to, uh, to have um, our people out running the what is Australia's National Phenome Centre. Um, I take issue with either yourself or my mother, though, Elaine, because she already always told me that when I was a little bit queasy, that was butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> I'll be going home tonight and telling you it's one to two kilo of bacteria, actually. <laughs> so anyway, I'll, I'll trust you uh, on that one. So thank you, everyone, that came along tonight, and thank you to those people uh, who are watching online. We've been a part of this community, and by we I mean Murdoch uh, University, uh, since 1998, providing educational and employment and research opportunities for people living in the Rockingham, Quinana and Peel districts. And I hope you leave here this evening uh, with a sense of pride in what's being achieved in your community uh, for the benefit of people here uh, at home and all over the world with this, uh, this Phenome Centre that has been doing COVID research uh, with uh, other universities globally. It's the university's intention to continue this lecture series in partnership with Madeleine uh, into 2021. So I hope you'll all continue to provide us with great turn-ups like uh, we've seen tonight. It's obviously of keen interest and we want to keep interesting you and have you come along. So on behalf of Murdoch University, thank you all again for coming and I'll hand back to Madeline. Thanks again, everyone, for coming, uh, and to Elaine. It was a fantastic talk, and I think we all learned a lot. I've got a lot of notes myself. Have a very lovely evening. Thanks to the people online, and we'll see you at our next lecture. Keep your eye on for the ads and on Facebook, and we'll keep in touch. Thanks so much. Good night.